The combat capability of modern armies depends on a careful balance of various types of weapons. Tanks, infantry, artillery, and attack helicopters. The United States Armed Forces coordinate these elements in their heavy maneuver divisions. The basic combat formation of modern land armies is the division. Divisions contain all of the elements needed to wage land combat, including infantry, armor, artillery, and airborne forces. A division is a complex organization comprised of several smaller combat formations. The smallest unit is a squad made up of approximately 10 troops. A platoon contains two to four squads. Three to five platoons form a company. Four to six companies form the basic maneuver element called a battalion. A brigade is composed of two to five battalions. And a division usually consists of three brigades. Divisions are substantial in size, including 10,000 to 20,000 troops, nearly 500 armored vehicles, and 2,000 various support vehicles. Divisions are traditionally divided into two categories. The heavy maneuver divisions, such as armor and mechanized infantry divisions, and the light divisions, including light infantry, airborne, and air assault divisions. The heavy maneuver divisions are the largest and most powerful divisions on today's battlefield, combining a potent mixture of tanks, infantry, artillery, attack helicopters, and logistic support. Two types of heavy maneuver divisions exist, armored divisions and mechanized infantry divisions. All the heavy divisions, be they infantry or armor, uh, pretty much are, are a mirror of each other, except uh, from one difference of one battalion, one armored battalion. We'll have a mix of Bradley Fighting Vehicle Infantry Battalions and M1 Tank Battalions. That mix gives us a good balance for firepower, for, for movement, and for, uh, for communications command and control. With that, we'll have self-propelled artillery to, to back them up. A 155 millimeter plus a battery of MLRS and a multiple uh, uh, launch rocket system. There's a battery in each division. We also have an aviation brigade that includes one battalion of Apache helicopters, day, night, long range uh, precision weapons, and a battalion of general support aviation, uh, Blackhawks and some Hueys. And we also include with that some of the uh, small observation helicopters that are used to designate artillery, precision artillery fires, the OH-58 Delta. The composition of mechanized infantry and armor divisions evolved out of land tactics developed during World War I. In the First World War, before the introduction of the tank, most armies were based around infantry divisions. These divisions alone proved inadequate when faced with innovations in tactics and technology, especially the new machine guns and artillery. To a certain extent, tanks were a solution to this problem. But a greater dilemma remained. How should modern combat arms, the tank, the infantry, the artillery, be organized to optimize performance on the battlefield? World War II saw considerable experimentation with new tactics, including units based mainly around tanks. By the end of the war, a new strategy emerged called combined arms. 
The divisions that had proven most successful were a careful blend of infantry, armor, and artillery. So was born the modern heavy maneuver division. Heavy maneuver divisions are well suited to high intensity conflicts, such as 1991's Operation Desert Storm. Conventional light infantry remains essential in low intensity conflicts, such as guerrilla and urban warfare, where heavy maneuver divisions would get bogged down. There are situations where the light infantry can go in, where the maneuverability is not there with the track vehicles. You just can't do it. Uh, swamps, the bogged down areas, you can't do it. When you talk about combat in the cities, can we do that in the mech infantry? Yes, we can do that, we can do it very well. The light infantry can do it, and they can do it just as well, in some cases better, because of the number of people they can put on the ground. The maneuver divisions are so named for their tactical mobility. The heavy maneuver divisions substitute motor power for human endurance. When I was in a, a regular infantry unit in Vietnam, I carried a map and would routinely plan on moving one to two kilometers per hour. In a mechanized or armored division, you carry a map sheet, and let me emphasize the plural of that, and you routinely plan to move 25 to 30 kilometers an hour, routinely. Routinely, and that's day, night, all weather, any conditions, for long periods of time. When you're carrying a rucksack, you're going two and a half kilometers an hour max. And after about three or four days, you don't have a chance to stop and rest and clean up and get some hot food. Uh, you're just about pushing limits. One of the most critical questions in the evolution of modern maneuver tactics has been the relationship of infantry and tanks. Some theorists in World War II thought that the tank alone would dominate the battlefield. But it soon became apparent that in many circumstances, tanks without infantry could be vulnerable. Tanks need maneuver space to maximize that firepower, that speed, that shock effect. And as long as you got that maneuver space and you can run them hard and you can fire on the move and destroy things and do it rapidly, you don't have a problem. But you're going to hit terrain and you're going to hit enemy, you're going to hit obstacles that the tanks can't maneuver through or get through. There will be terrain. There will be restricted terrain. That tanks got to line up like ducks in a row and get through there. Well, the enemy can put uh, a tank killer team on the other end of this road knock out the first tank and stop the entire convoy. Well, that guy has to be eliminated. Uh, tankers will not dismount to go do that. They, they, they're not, they've got four-man crews. We can put our mech infantry on the ground. They can clear these obstacles. Heavy maneuver divisions employ mechanized infantry battalions. The principal difference between a mechanized infantry battalion and a traditional infantry battalion is the use of infantry fighting vehicles in the mechanized battalions. The mechanized designation tells you that they, they primarily move and shoot uh, with, uh, with, with armored vehicles, uh, infantry fighting vehicles and tanks. And that differentiates from, say, a pure infantry uh, division. Infantry vehicles evolved along with mechanized infantry tactics. The U.S. Army infantry vehicle of World War II was the M3 half-track. Such a vehicle had a limited amount of armored protection, and its rear tracks gave it better mobility in rough terrain than an Army truck. In the 1950s and 60s, infantry vehicles evolved into fully tracked armored personnel carriers, such as the M113. These vehicles were completely armored, though not as heavily protected as tanks. In the 1980s, the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle emerged. 
The main advantage of the Bradley over earlier vehicles is its tremendous firepower. A 25mm auto cannon and a pair of tow guided anti tank missiles on the turret. The Bradley fighting vehicle gives you a whole new aspect, both in cross country mobility, firepower, both range, lethality, and the fact it's a stabilized gun system. Day and night, cross country, it can shoot on the move accurately. And then it gives you the, uh, the, the enhanced communications of a vehicle mounted radio plus the protection. Uh, right now with the, uh, with the Bradley, it will take up to 23 millimeters and survive well. Infantry vehicles expand the tactical options of the infantry commander. In some situations, the infantry can remain inside the armored protection of the Bradley. But if needed, the infantry can dismount from the vehicle and conduct the mission on foot using traditional infantry tactics. Each Bradley IFV carries six infantrymen in the rear compartment. For any on the ground, hand-to-hand -hand conflicts, naturally you're gonna to have to dismount the soldiers. They're gonna be the ones that do the close-in close -in fighting, and they're gonna be the ones that secure the enemy prisoners of war. Tanks provide the shock force of modern land armies. They overwhelm an enemy with firepower and mobility and protect themselves with thick layers of armor. The U.S. Army's current main battle tank is the M1 Abrams. The M1 is armed with a 120 millimeter gun, two 7.62 millimeter machine guns, and a 50 caliber machine gun. These 67-ton vehicles also have thermal sights, a laser rangefinder, and advanced digital communication systems. As formidable as such tanks are, there is still the need for close cooperation between them and the infantry they fight alongside. One of the most worrisome threats that a tanker faces is an enemy armed with small, portable anti-tank rockets and missiles. Tanks are, have blind sides. Tanks always will have blind sides to them. You, you've, uh, you can't defend 360 degrees from a tank. You can def and, and also, uh, passively, at night, uh, you can defend from a tank with thermal sights and then with guys up in the hatches. But you don't really have the crew members to, to run patrols. The infantrymen give you the opportunity to defend aggressively, which means, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, but what it means is that you can put guys on the ground patrolling, making sure they're not putting mines and booby traps out, uh, making sure they're not sneaking up to, put, uh, to, uh, to do your tanks in from close quarters with uh, infantry mounted weapons. Tanks and infantry can be used side by side. However, combined arms tactics usually require tailoring your strategy to the operation at hand. That is, the mission and terrain often dictate a division's formation and movement. Because tanks are more thickly armored than infantry fighting vehicles, the tanks often lead the attack. Well, obviously the tank has great firepower and, and mobility. Uh, so from a shock effect, uh, depending on the situation, uh, you would want to, if, if the enemy situation is unknown, but likely that they have armor forces, uh, probably want to lead with tanks and follow with mech infantry then to develop and to exploit the success of the tanks through the enemy lines. If, on the other hand, the enemy is dug in uh, in bunkered, revetted positions, 
uh, and we know that we will have to fight through that. Uh, we need the infantry then to, to be able to dismount and uh, to do that, to, to fight the enemy soldiers out of their positions, and also the uh, firepower the, the Bradley carries, the machine guns, the 25 millimeter, uh, provides uh, great capability to do that. The maneuver division has an impressive amount of firepower at its disposal. Besides the direct fire provided by the Abrams and Bradleys, indirect fire from artillery battalions and the ordnance of attack helicopters can further contribute to the combined arms battle. Artillery has long been called the king of battle, gravely weakening an opponent by pounding enemy positions before an attack. In maneuver formations, the field artillery brigade implements this tactic. Our role is to provide indirect fire support for the maneuver forces. So that means we need to be up with them so that we can uh, fire at targets that, they, uh, that may influence their uh, scheme of maneuver. We need to, basically though, we need to destroy the other enemy's artillery and we need to be pretty close to the, uh, because of the range of our systems, we don't want to be too far back from maneuver forces. The divisional artillery weapons in maneuver formations are mounted on track vehicles to ensure that the artillery can move with the tanks and mechanized infantry. The backbone of the division's artillery is the M109 Paladin self-propelled 155 millimeter howitzer. A battalion of Paladins can deliver a ton of projectiles and high explosives in a single salvo. Adding to the punch of the howitzers is the MLRS artillery rocket launcher. A single one of its 12 rockets can devastate an area the size of a football field. Helicopters have added a new dimension to the maneuver division. The division's aviation brigade performs a wide variety of roles using several types of helicopters. The UH-60 Blackhawk is the basic troop carrier. The CH-47 Chinook provides heavy lift capability, hauling supplies, vehicles and light artillery. The AH-64 Apache serves with the division's attack helicopter battalion. You ready? One, one thing. That's, oh, that's a, yeah. For firepower support, nothing matches the Apache. A maneuver division might field a single Apache attack helicopter battalion with as many as 18 of these helicopters. The Apache can provide the ground forces with three main types of firepower. Its 30 millimeter cannon can destroy lightly armored vehicles. And its 2.75 inch rocket pods give it high explosive firepower, much like an airborne artillery platform. But its most lethal weapon is the Hellfire anti-tank missile, which can destroy any tank in existence. The Hellfire is laser guided, with a range in excess of five miles. The Apaches serve as the division commander's reaction force. Because of their great speed compared to ground forces, the Apaches can race to nearly any trouble spot and provide concentrated pinpoint firepower. If it's within artillery range, I think the, uh, the commanding general would use artillery and his ground forces to take care of it. When it's out on the fringes of that uh, capability, then he would use attack helicopters. Now, when you, when you think about the firepower that you get from both artillery 
ground forces and the attack helicopter. It's just a, uh, a dynamite combination. During the 1991 Gulf War, the 24th Infantry Division demonstrated the combat effectiveness of combined arms. After a ceasefire was declared on February 27th, Iraqi Republican Guard units attempted to break out of their encirclement near the Ramalia oil fields. We had overrun and routed about five more divisions who had fled and, and, uh, and, uh, and run towards Bosnia. We did security operations for about two more days, and on the uh, morning of 2 March, uh, the Hammurabi Division uh, attempted to break out of the Basra area, uh, engaged our uh, security elements in direct fire, and whereupon we, uh, uh, we sealed them into a pocket. The Iraqi Hammurabi Division intended to break out of the Ramalia pocket across a causeway leading back into central Iraq. They substantially outnumbered the task force of Lieutenant Colonel Ware standing in their way. And I request permission to return fire because my Charlie company was in danger and he would have been the guy that would have been really, if you want to say, hit hardest because he was closest to the, the southern edge of the Ramalia oil fields. And uh, we got word back from Brigade to uh, that we could return fire. Just as that word came back, then Sager started going at Charlie Company. The tanks that turned on him and tank fire reports came in, reports of tank fire. And there were explosions on the ground uh, down in my Echo Company and around Charlie Company. I could see them from my position. We had the artillery seal off the southern end. The MLRS uh, uh, and the 141 did some firing down there too. And up in the north, we had the Apache helicopter seal off the northern end where these guys were uh, getting across the bypass in the causeway that we didn't know was there. We rolled in to the battle position. Alpha Company was already engaging targets. Uh, they were almost out of uh, weapons and uh, ordnance. So we relieved them on station. They broke for fuel. We occupied the battle position and continued the battle. So there was no delay in the firepower that was being focused on those targets in the Romali oil field. Uh, the Bravo Company st stayed there online. We were in the battle position for no more than 25 minutes. Every aircraft I had fired almost all of its weapons. Uh, we came back with only a couple Hellfires, uh, some 30 millimeter, and very few rockets. Uh, there were plenty of targets to hit. With the Iraqis tied down by the infantry and the causeway sealed off by artillery and Apaches, Colonel Lemoyne ordered one of his tank battalions to counterattack. Brigade commander uh, came forward and they gave me the uh, execute mission and we attacked into the oil field up two axes and uh, destroyed large amounts of Iraqi armor and supporting type vehicles, combat support, combat service support. By about 1500 hours, uh, about four hours later, the oil field was secure. So it was, uh, uh, in my opinion, a textbook operation, an air land battle. By the end of the battle of the Ramalia oil field, the Iraqis had lost 185 armored vehicles and about 500 trucks and support vehicles. A clear demonstration of the power of combining technology, firepower, training, and tactics. Technology alone does not win wars. Well-organized combat units employing the right mix of equipment and personnel, rigorously trained and skillfully led, are at the heart of today's armor force.